This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. So, with yesterday's experience of going slower and slower as the lectures went by, I figured I would actually switch uh, to a different mode of presentation. Uh, but it's also because what I'm going to talk about now is, is sort of necessarily going to be more qualitative uh, or even more qualitative than what I was doing yesterday. And so what I will do in today's lecture is um, pick up from where we left off. I had sort of ended on, on, on uh, arguing that uh, the Hawking effect could uh, be viewed as sort of an adiabatic evolution on some nice slices in, a, in some effective field theory. We don't know or we don't need to know the details of the, of the field theory to um, be able to discuss it. So the, our background space-time is this. We have, uh, as we discussed yesterday, um, and so I'm going to imagine that this space-time and this Penrose diagram is the result of solving some equations, coupled equations of matter and uh, so semi-classical equations of, of, of matter and, uh, and gravity with uh, quantum effects, at least leading order quantum effects due to the matter taking into account. And, uh, and then we're going to see that we, we're going to have a problem um, as follows. So I'm going to have two formulations of this, uh, of the paradox. Uh, one is maybe, is pretty much the same as what um, uh, Kyriakos told us about yesterday. Uh, and we're going to, I'm going to show you the same, pretty much the same diagram. Um, and then the second one is more, a little bit of an elaboration of, uh, as, as Kyriakos pointed out, if you have a duplication of, of, of information or quantum cloning in your space-time, then that is a problem for quantum mechanics. And I'm simply going to show you a simple Gedanken experiment where that problem would, would, would manifest itself. OK, so we imagine that we have some system that starts out in a pure initial state. And the system we have in mind is some diffuse uh, distribution of matter so that there is no strong curvature, so strong gravitational effects initially. Then this matter will undergo gravitational collapse. It will form a black hole. And then that black hole, as we discussed yesterday, is going to evolve further. It's going to gradually emit Hawking radiation and eventually, uh, well, for most of its lifetime, we anticipate that the semi-classical approximation should be valid. Of course, this is something that can be called into question. Uh, but if we do, then what will be left at the end of the black hole evaporation is at most some Planck scale object. Of course, the semi-classical approximation is going to break down by when you get down to that. So there might be some object left at the end of the day, but it's going to be a small object compared to the large initial black hole. And then the question is, in this process, when you have an initial state with matter in some pure state, pure quantum state, of course, it's completely out of the question in practice to form such a thing. I mean, this is all, all a question of principle here. Um, and then the final state, which is outgoing train, long train of Hawking radiation, plus perhaps some small object left behind. Um, is that going to be a unitary process? That's the basic question here. Because if it's not, well, then it's not in line with the principles of, of uh, quantum field theory. So, and the point then is, and this is why we call this the information pro uh, paradox, is that unitarity can be stated that the final state is going to be given by some S matrix, unitary S matrix that's acting on the initial state, but a unitary S matrix can be inverted, so it means that the end state can also be obtained from the conjugate matrix. And that means that the final state must therefore carry all information, all the quantum information that was in the initial state. And in fact, it carries precisely that information and, 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 and nothing else. 
Okay. Now, we're going to investigate this in the context of some effective field theory, as I uh, discussed in my second lecture yesterday. And we're going to assume, and this is an assumption, that local effective field theory can be applied at any time that we are sort of, unless we have explicit reasons to, to distrust it, that is, unless there is strong curvature, in which case these higher order terms that we're ignoring in the effective Lagrangian are equally important as the, as the, as the leading ones. And also, uh, we want this effective field theory to be on a reasonable set of Cauchy surfaces, ones that do not have kinks in them or not strong extrinsic curvatures. Because that will also lead to induced terms in this uh, nice slice Hamiltonian. Okay, so we make those assumptions. And as I said earlier, we don't really need to know that the effective field theory, the details of it, we just need to know that, that it's there, or we're going to assume that it's there. And then this will uh, generate a unitary evolution of states. And, <coughs> and let's see what this, how, how this looks then on this uh, background space-time that, that I discussed. So. Um, I imagine I have some early Cauchy surface here. Um, maybe we'd want to have it closer to, to the you know, early. But again, remember, this is a Penrose diagram, so early and late, this can be a little bit deceptive there. Important thing is that it's one that is entirely before the event horizon forms. And then we have this Cauchy surface that I label sigma p. That's the one that is, is part of the family of nice slices that actually extend into the black hole. These are the ones that I, I discussed yesterday. And then finally, and by the way, yes, that one can then, the horizon will divide that into two pieces, and one of them I call the black hole part, and the other one the external part. And there may be some uh, UV subtleties about how you actually do this division, but whether there is really a tensor product Hilbert space, but I'm assuming, of course, that, I'm, that in this infrared, that there's, sorry, an ultraviolet regulator that's part of my effective field theory definition. So uh, this, is not, uh, this is not a major obstacle to, uh, to, to formulating this. So I'm going to simply ignore that problem here. And then I have a final uh, Cauchy surface, which there might be, this might here, this r equal to zero, might be the world line of a, of a remnant that's left behind, or not. If there's no remnant, well, then this is just uh, the, the origin. OK. And so then the argument goes roughly as follows. We're going to start with a pure initial state, and then we're going to use our effective field theory on our nice slices to evolve forward to this state. And because it's a Hamiltonian evolution, that is going to be a unitary relationship between those two. OK. On the other hand, I can also think about the evolution that got me to this state. And that one will have been an evolution that comes from a state that's only on the external part, because nothing that goes on on this part here, that's by definition inside the black hole, so it's not going to affect the state over here if this is a local effective theory. And that means that to get there, what I need, so the description that I have on this part, this is only part of the Cauchy surface, so I have to do a, uh, I trace over the modes that are in here. That leads to a density matrix on this part, and therefore, and then that density matrix evolves forward to out here. And the net result is that an initial pure state, uh, if there's any information that is, if this, if the part of the state that's sitting in here if this, well, let me put it more precisely, if the element on this tensor product space is not a pure, is not a, 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 just a product state, then, um, then this density matrix on the external part is going to be impure. And therefore, the uh, final density matrix will therefore also be impure because a unitary evolution will not take a, 
you know, it, it, it will not regenerate purity. Okay? But by the way, there is no problem if there is no information on here. In other words, if this state here is completely uncorrelated with the initial state, the part that's inside the black hole, then all the quantum information about the initial state is sitting over here. It will then just evolve forward and you will have your standard unitary S matrix. Now, of course, this is, would not be reasonable from the point of view of our thinking about this as a local effective field theory that's undergoing some slow and fairly undramatic uh, evolution here. But it's a logical possibility that simply no information goes into the black hole and then you don't lose any, any information. This is, of course, the resolution that's, that's on offer if you have a firewall at the uh, black hole. That's precisely you're implementing unitarity by not letting any information into the black hole. It's also, by the way, the resolution that we offer when we talk about black hole complementarity, but in a more, in a, in a rather subtle way over there. And I'll get to that in a minute. Sorry, just to make sure I understand you correctly. You are saying that the total uh, 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 Hamiltonian uh, has a unitary evolution, but the part which uh, acts on H black hole or H external are not unitary. Uh, no, uh, what I'm, of course, what this leads to is that this is not, it doesn't hang together as it stands. You have this unitary evolution. <laughs> so if local effective field theory evolution from the initial state is going to give you some generic state here with a unitary relationship with here. Okay? If you also insist that there be a unitary relationship to the final state, then you have a problem. Because you then, that, that cannot be the, the case. So you can't have both in, in within the confines of effective field theory. Okay? All right. Now, yeah, let me actually wait with this for a little bit. So let's just think about what are the possi logical possibilities that this can entail. Well, Hawking concluded that, well, you just have to take this at face value and that once gravitational effects are taking into account, quantum evolution simply isn't unitary. And I'll <clears throat> have a few more words to say about that. So that's usually called basically information loss. And that was the, his proposal. Um, and he did more than just, say, he didn't throw up his hand. He said, well, we'll therefore have to modify how we do quantum theory. And so I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, another possibility that Kiriakos mentioned yesterday is that the information goes into the black hole, but it stays there. And at the end of the day, you have this remnant that's actually carrying all the initial uh, information. That's a, um, also a logical possibility until you start examining more, more closely what, you, what this would entail. Uh, and you really try to implement this in, in, a, in a theory. So I'll come back to that as well. But I, I think we need to distinguish. There is a, a, a very important difference whether this remnant is a very small scale object that's left behind after this semi-classical evolution completes or whether somehow some effects uh, will actually halt the, and, and really stop this semi-classical evolution that, um, and so that's, that's also a logical possibility. It was explored by Steve uh, back, in, back in the early 90s. Uh, more recently, uh, you can think of this uh, firewall proposal also sort of to fall into this category because once you have this firewall, it's certainly not the standard black hole that you have, have left behind. And I think it's anybody's guess whether, you're, you, know, whether you will have further uh, evaporation or not. Okay, then there is the question whether that unitarity really is a more fundamental principle than, than, <coughs> than so that you can just give it up. And that it is true, of course, that we don't really know how to formulate a quantum theory without it. Uh, and there was a, this attempt by Hawking was not entirely successful. And then there are, uh, and so this comes in some uh, uh, different forms. There's this 
notion of black hole complementarity that I will talk about later, later today. Um, there are other ways to implement unitarity. There's this uh, uh, so-called final state projection idea, which uh, is a very, very non-local. Uh, um, you implement unitarity simply by projecting this, this statement that I said, that there's no information carried in the interior of the black hole. You sort of implement that on the final state that comes there, and uh, in, you know, in the inside evolution, and again, it's not entirely clear how you, in fact, we don't really have a theory that, of, of how that would work, but uh, it's, uh, again, a logical possibility that has been proposed. Now, you can reformulate these issues in, in uh, ADS, for eternal ADS black holes. They have a different character because they're, uh, those things are not formed and evaporating in collapse, so it's a different set of questions that you need to ask, and Kiriakos, I think, is going to do that, so I will not have say much about that. Uh, there have also been a lot of work on sort of modifications to the geometry and, and that uh, somehow that individual black hole microstates are actually have, are non-singular and not really have, have a very different character from uh, the semi-classical sort of black hole geometries that I've been describing. Again, these are interesting ideas. I, I think Samir will talk about that in his lecture, so I will, I will leave it at that. Now, there are more recent suggestions that have. Uh, there's the uh, suggestion from, or, or the sort of um, an attempt to uh, explain how, now Kiriakos talked about this in, in, in his talk yesterday, that if you're going to have unitarity uh, implemented in the evolution process, there have to be some uh, interactions that actually transfer the information from the infolding matter to the outgoing radiation. And so the question is how, how dramatically does this happen? In the firewall proposal, this is a, done in a, in a rather abrupt way. Um, but in these, uh, and I think Steve, Steve is going to talk about this in his colloquium tomorrow, uh, you can ask the question whether some fairly weak couplings between the black hole states and the, and the, and the matter could actually implement this uh, without it being overly dramatic at the horizon. And so you'll hear more about that tomorrow. There's also the recent work by Hawking, Perry, and Strominger, where you sort of one of the, when you formulate the black hole uh, paradox, you one of the ingredients that goes into it is that the actual black hole geometry doesn't <coughs> keep any memory of where it came from. It's, uh, this was also mentioned by Kiriakos, that uh, we have basically the only information that's left at the classical level is the mass of the black hole or, or any sort of charge that's coupled to some long-range gauge field. So if it has an electric charge or if it's ro rotating, those, those will also be... Uh, so that's the kind of classical hair that a black hole can have. In, 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 these, in a series of papers, these authors have been <coughs> suggesting that there is actually a subtle uh, hair that's, um, or that there's information that's actually residing in some um, uh, uh, charges to uh, symmetries that, that act on, the, on both, well, you can either formulate, well, it's a version of the, of the BMS symmetry that's normally implemented at asymptotic infinity that, that's being uh, implemented at the horizon. Now, the latest installment of that came out just, I think, this week or last week, and I don't really, haven't had, uh, look, haven't really looked at that so much, so I'm not going to go into that. Okay. Um, before I go and look further at these, let me take a little bit, uh, take a look at this, or we'll walk you through this Gedanken experiment. It's something that's been very useful in studying this problem over the years, has been to formulate a given, of course, we're not going to make these black holes uh, in, in, in the lab. Well, maybe we are. There are some people who think they can at least make analog black holes in some cold atom systems. I think that would be extremely interesting. Uh, but it, but in the absence of that, what we can do is to imagine what happens in various situations. So we can set up Gedanken experiments 
um, for and discuss what different observers might observe. So here's an example, and one which has been used quite a lot. Uh, it was formulated in a paper by uh, Sosha in 1993 or 4. And so this is where you want to actually test this. You want to see that this cloning, quantum cloning, you might say, OK, there's no problem that if you have, if you make a copy of the information that's carried by uh, Alice into this uh, black hole, even if all that information is residing in the Hawking radiation, well, may, maybe that's not a problem if, if, since the black hole is, is causally disconnect from, from the, but um, that is uh, maybe you sh we need to look at it a little bit more closely. So let's take, take, think about uh, the following experiment. You begin by preparing uh, an EPR pair, so a pair of spins that, um, that are then separated. And then, as, as, as you all know, if a measurement is made of the, one of those spins in, in along some axis, well, that will project the other spin to be in the opposite direction of that same, no matter how far they are apart. So we're going to use that effect to see if we can establish some, uh, some contradiction in this. Uh, and normally, this doesn't lead to any contradictions, because even though this projection happens, you can't really use it. You can't harness it to send signals. And I'm going to set up a situation where there will be some probability for actually sending an a-causal signal based on an experiment like this. So let's see how the argument goes. So you start by preparing the pair. And then Charlie is instructed to go away from the black hole to a safe distance. And then they've synchronized their clocks before they started the experiment. And at a given time that's agreed upon beforehand, he flips a coin. And based on the outcome of that coin flip, he either measures the x component or the z component of the, uh, of the spin. And the, the coin flip comes in to make sure that Bob and Alice have no way of knowing which experiment he's going to carry out. OK? Because Charlie doesn't know until he does the coin flip. Meanwhile, they keep track of time by the black hole. And at the right time when they know that Charlie is doing his measurement, and not much before, Alice takes the other spin into the black hole and measures it along the z direction. So she takes it into the black hole. She immediately reads off the spin when she's inside and broadcasts the result. Now, why bother broadcasting the result? She's inside a black hole, and nobody is going to hear it. Well, that's because Bob is actually going to try to pick up the signal. So Bob hovers outside the black hole. Well, he does more than that. He actually must have some sort of like a Dyson sphere of detectors around the black hole. He detects all the Hawking radiation that comes out. And um, I guess to really do this, you would need an ensemble of identically prepared black holes and do statistical observations on all these measurements. But let's leave that aside. And uh, basically measures the state of the black hole. And that includes, of course, if we're right about the information coming out, that'll include the information about the outcome of this experiment. They are certainly spatially separated at this point, yes. Therefore, any observations that they make, if there's an effective field theory to underlying this, those will be independent. And that's key, all right? So Bob makes his, um, and then once he has done his measurements, so he has got his own measurement of the Z component of, let's call it one prime, that's basically the quantum clone of of, of, of one that's been uh, sort of is somewhere embedded there in the, in the Hawking radiation. And then uh, he immediately jumps into the black hole to follow Alice in order to see if he can get her signal. And then he gets her signal, and they either agreed or they didn't, right? Each of them had a possibility of getting one answer. And if Charlie also measured the set axis, we know for 100% they will, they will have agreed, because that will have projected the, uh, the partner of this one into a particular z eigenstate. 
On the other hand, if Charlie measured the x-axis, well then they're making independent observations on a state that is a superposition of up and down in, 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 in the z-direction, so they will not necessarily agree. So if Bob finds out, so there's an, there is an amplitude now, there is a probability, so with some probability, Bob would go in here, he would discover that Alice actually got a different answer than he did, and then he would know for sure what it is that Charlie did. And that's a cause, and now there's been, we have used this quantum cloning to actually turn this EPR correlation into a, an EPR communication. Okay, so that's just an example of how you can sort of lead yourself to a contradiction. And notice that all of this is taking place while the black hole can, is still going to be quite large. Now exactly how large we're going to discuss later on, but um, so these nice slices, at least on the face of it, look like they're quite valid. They're not yet near the, any singularity. Yes? Um, so do, do I understand correctly that you assume that the, the, the number two state is uh, uh, entangled with the number one state, not, but not number one prime? No, it will stay, you know, one prime is a copy of, one prime is just a measurement of one that's being done by observing the Hawking radiation. But you can't do it. I mean, quantum copying is one of the operations you can't do. Obviously, yes. I'm just saying that if you could, which is what this is suggesting. But then you don't need a black hole. Then you can send messages. Exactly. Right. And so the assumption, of course, that you would now immediately say, well, because effective field theory holds, there, there isn't any information in the radiation. Right? That's what Hawking would have said, right? This is all that we're testing here is if we make the assumption that the information comes out, that will lead to a paradox. If we don't make that assumption, we don't get any paradox at this level, that's fine. But we will find that we have non-unitary evolution. So this is what, the, what, what is the problem here, is that you, you have to give up something, right? And the question is, what are you willing to give up? So let's, let's go to that. All right, now, if we take Hawking's result at face value and say that there is this Hawking radiation that comes out is purely thermal, that it does not carry any information about the initial state, well, we need to then implement that in a theory that uh, allows us to have pure states evolve into, into mixed states. And this will lead to uh, issues in microscopic physics because you can imagine pair creating black holes and, and you would, presumably we will pair create quantum states that describe microscopic black holes just like anything else. And those will then uh, evolve. So then th th there will be microscopic processes where the pure state will be evolving into mixed state even in the absence of having any large black hole around. And so he tried to formulate a theory that would actually implement this. And uh, basically, he replaced states by density matrices. And then he had a superscattering operator that mapped density matrix, initial density matrix to a final density matrix and, 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 and gave some rules of procedure for doing calculations that uh, would have a, a, allowed for the sort of non-unitary evolution that, uh, that, that you would need in this case. Now, this was investigated by these authors here, uh, these two groups here in, in shortly afterwards. And with some technical assumptions that they made, and it's clear that uh, those were assumptions that were possibly, uh, there might be some loopholes to that argument. Uh, what they found was that they could actually take this uh, generalized quantum mechanics of Hawking and see that it was actually conventional quantum mechanics that was coupled to a random source at order one strength in Planck units. And so you might say that this is a perfectly fine theory, but it has a phenomenological problem, which is that its ground state is actually not the vacuum that we're living in, but it's one which is, you know, you have Planck temperature everywhere. And this is something which uh, seems to be a rather... Uh, difficult problem to get around. Now, there are authors who, who believe that they can get around it, so there are some papers here that I want to draw your attention to that uh, are actually trying to have this decoherence without this strong dissipation going on. And uh, 
if you're interested in, in, in these ideas, then you should definitely take a look at those. Okay. So what about the remnants? Uh, well, remnants have problems of their own. Uh, in particular, let me, let me address the Planck scale remnants. So there the idea is that you know, all the information about the initial state is basically stored in this stable remnant that has some word line at the end of the day. And it is highly entangled with all the Hawking radiation that went out. So the overall process hasn't lost any unitarity, but this remnant is in this tiny object that is, is um, carrying a lot of entropy. And in fact, there cannot be any limit to the entropy that these things can, because you can imagine an arbitrarily large initial black hole. So you have to think basically about an infinite density of state, an infinite degeneracy at the Planck scale. And that will lead to problems because things, well, they will couple gravitationally. They have mass. They are Planck-massed objects. And now that may, be a, may not be a very strong coupling that they have. But basically any process that you imagine contemplating, you know, you think about light being, <laughs> light being generated here, up in the light bulbs here, they would have a contribution from remnants going around in loops. And the amplitude for each one of these is going to be tiny, but they're going to be multiplied by an infinity, which is the number of, you know, some of the, the remnant states. So this is, uh, leads to problems. There's, there are loopholes possible to this as well. Uh, in particular, there are these ideas that people were exploring first in the, in the 90s and then, then followed up uh, more recently, where the remnant was really, um, sort of had an interesting topology, and it was actually connected to some sort of long throat region that was extended. So the, they, were, they basically were large on the inside. You know, I sometimes refer to these as TARDIS remnants. And then they would be actually very weakly coupled and, and progressively less strongly coupled to the, to, the, to the surrounding worlds, the further away down the throat that information was. So it was, I think th those models were not uh, ruled out at the time, it was more that sort of time passed them by because um, shortly afterwards uh, somebody wrote a paper about deep brains and, uh, and people, yeah. Just a comment, uh, you know, one of the really unphysical things with regard to this blue argument is the uh, argument for infinite pair production. That yeah, yeah, that's that, sure. But that's yeah. also going to be uh, alleviated, at least according to Tom, because of these long horns that... That, that was the claim, but I think that it's, it, you can see that that's not true. Uh, and, you know, one example is to look at the pair production of uh, charged black holes. And the, the basic point is that no matter what, you always have a coupling via the charge or the mass. And so in the background field, you always pair for your Okay. No, I'm, 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 I've got no complaints with that. Uh, I think I have another argument against remnants, which is if you think, uh, I guess in this place, you know, people are inclined to think string theory has something to do with the uh, being a fundamental theory of the world, and these remnants are simply not there. We know the states that we have in string theory. We know the non-perturbative states, uh, you know, their brains, and, uh, and uh, they don't have behavior like this. So I think that's also one reason why people simply have lost interest in this as a, as a, as a possibility. Okay, so let me then think about information return. So this was proposed very early by uh, Don Page, where he simply stipulated that you could have unitary restored, unitarity restored by having it be sort of information being gradually transmitted from the black hole with the Hawking radiation, and that is what, what a lot of people are, are uh, sort of implementing in different ways <coughs> these days. Now, this is uh, the question is, of course, then how does it uh, work? Because it clearly cannot be in, in using just a conventional local effective field theory, because as we argued earlier, that simply wouldn't happen there. Uh, the so, the way this has been formulated, and this was initially due to Tuft and then uh, these groups here shortly afterwards, is you put forward postulates, and these, there are three postulates that everybody agrees on in that, 
And the first one is simply that there is an S matrix. So that is, now the way, the, these postulates, by the way, were, the, we formulated them in this, precisely this way in, in this paper, but the, the others were, you know, saying the same thing. So there is basically, if you are far away from a black hole uh, and you uh, have, you know that there was a pure state that went in, then this first postulate says that if you, that in principle you should be able to reconstruct all the information about that initial state from whatever comes out. Uh, okay. Now, postulate two was that once you're outside a black hole, and precisely how far outside you have to go has to do with this, and we'll, I'll talk more about the stretched horizon idea in a minute. A massive black hole here just means that it's large. We, that's all we meant, we, we, you know. Um, large compared to the, the Planck scale. Basically, business should be, it should be business as usual. So this was the postulate that, that whatever you have to do to resolve this problem, we know that effective field theory works in our labs, you know, to explain what we see in our labs. And so that was, we, we put that as, as a condition that whatever we do, we should basically see if, we, if there's not a big black hole around, we, we, we should not be uh, sort of um, fiddling too much with our theories because they're working quite well. And then the third postulate is simply to really take seriously the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy as, as a count of the number of degrees of freedom. And so what exactly does number two imply? So first of all, what imply is uh, outside, like is it like 1.1 Schwarzschild radius? Uh, we're, 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 we'll get to that. And that's like two slides from now. Right. Uh, I mean, you, you can ask about the, the gravitation geometry, or you can ask about the, the, the field theory for some. some no, this would be this this field theory that you know the if whatever is the effective field theory of your system, it should be a good description if you are, you know, if all your observations are being carried out uh, <coughs> sufficiently far from a black hole. Exactly what is sufficiently far, we'll we'll have to get into. Okay, and then the last one is simply saying that this black hole really will behave like a system that has a finite number of degrees of freedom. And this is important because if you're going to use, if you use local effective field theory to describe the interior of a black hole, that is an infinite number of degrees of freedom that you're using. So this is really saying that whatever that you can do uh, to describe the interior of a black hole, it's not going to be a local field theory. Now, of course, these ideas are not so outlandish now because this is, of course, what you do when you have a holographic system you say you have some degrees of freedom on a boundary. Those are going to be, and you, you, you describe them by, by the area of the boundary. Um, and then it's only in the large n limit that you will recover a continuum description. Now, this is, of course, not a coincidence. This is where the holographic principle came from. This is the system that Toft and Susskind were thinking of when they were and, and coming to terms with this, that you would have only a finite number of degrees of freedom to describe and, and only an area's worth of degrees of freedom to describe the interior of a black hole. That really is what motivated their, their thinking towards the uh, much more general holographic principle. But here, by degrees of freedom, you mean number of states, right? The dimensionality of filtered space and not degrees of freedom per point. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I really mean number of states. Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay, and then there came the further statement uh, that we made, which uh, we didn't put forward as a postulate. We just said that this was a general belief that we shared, which is that if you're falling into a very large black hole, you'll fall through the horizon as if it wasn't there. Uh, that is the equivalence principle. This is a region of weak curvature, and so one shouldn't really <coughs> run into any problems there. Now, this is... Uh, so this we're putting forward as a principle, and that we're not, you know, this, this is not a theory, it's, it's a principle that says that whatever theory you're going to develop to, to, to solve this problem, it should have this feature. Um, and of course there are theories that people are putting forward that don't have this feature, and then, then you know, that's, that's then different. Now this will lead to th these issues that we just mentioned. This, if you have the information, if you, if you insist on these postulates, so the information is all coming back out, 
you also insist that an infalling observer will go unharmed into a black hole. Well, that means they will take information with them. That means you will have violated this cloning theorem. And the question is how, why is that not an obvious problem then? Well, our claim was, and still is, that if you're a low energy observer in any, you know, that is moving along, along some world line in this uh, space time, um, you will not be able to detect this duplication of information. In particular, in that Gedanken experiment that we, uh, we argue that Bob will in fact not be able to get a message from Alice and that he will be fundamentally prevented from doing so by the parameters of the problem. And I'll go into that in a minute. And these contradictions, they will only arise if you allow yourself, so to speak, to be a meta-observer. You allow yourself to talk about causally disconnected observers. You allow yourself to talk about information inside the black hole and outside at the same time. And don't really, you really should subject that always to this test of what can an observer see or not see in the geometry. And then we will see that if you stick to that, you will find that this rather outlandish idea, in, well, it's outlandish only if you do it in conjunction with assuming that the information is all submit, uh, uh, sent to infinity, you will then find that this is consistent with low energy physics as we know it, but it certainly you know, implies something quite radical at the gravitational, at the space-time level, because it says that uh, physics is quite non-local, and not just non-local on a small scale. If you have a very large black hole, um, we can, maybe I can illustrate this non-locality, and you know, there's an event in the life of an observer that's very important. That's when they're born, right? And there's another event that's equally important, that's when they die. And we talk about it as an event in space-time, right? Well, in this problem, it actually becomes observer-dependent where that event takes place. Because if you're a distant observer and you see some unfortunate person falling into a black hole, if this is correct, we would conclude that they must face that death before they ever get into the black hole because they are going to be absorbed into what we'll call the stretched horizon in a minute. And they will be, you know, whatever information was contained in them will be re-emitted with Hawking radiation without ever having gone into the black hole. The observer themselves, if it's a large black hole, according to this, will pass through the horizon. They will keep moving in. Of course, they will meet their end at the singularity, but that is in this diagram that we've been looking at. <coughs> that is a very different place, and this, this can be, a, there's a macroscopic distance between these two events. And so the notion of a local event is no longer then uh, as, as fundamental as it would be in an effective field theory. So I am just, I guess this is an acknowledgement that this is definitely not an innocuous thing that we're doing here. This is a, a large departure from. Okay, because it came up in, in, in a question yesterday, let me just briefly uh, come in this. Uh, you can tell that this is a very old slide that I've thrown in here. Um, so there are other ways to lose information than throwing things into black holes. So you can imagine burning, and, and, and for some reason people were very into, back in, this is a slide I made in the 90s, people were into burning cyclopedias or throwing them into black holes and, and then placing bets about what would happen. Uh, and then, um, so what happens here? Well, you're going to get some radiation and smoke that comes out. The radiation is gonna appear thermal and it's going to be and yet this, per this process, as, 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 you know, we, we, we fundamentally believe that it's not any violation of unitarity going on here, but it's an example of a system which is actually going to have subtle correlations between the early photons going on and out and, and the late ones. And at the end of the day, if you could pick up all the radiation that came out and all the smoke and the ashes, you would be able to reconstruct every word that had, was in the, initial, uh, in the original encyclopedia. But there is a key difference between this and the black hole problem, which is precisely that once this outgoing radiation contains the information, you will have burned the book. So there is no information in the book anymore. Uh, in the black hole, we're saying that, well, 
As far as the outside world is concerned, the process is actually not that different. There is a slow train of Hawking radiation that is sort of going to be early on very entangled with what's left of the black hole. At the late times, when the Hawking radiation actually uh, is carrying more of the states that, you know, more of the entropy or that, that the initial uh, system, sorry, when it has become sort of the larger of the two subsystems, if we go back to what Kiriakos talked about yesterday, uh, it is, um, then it is the black hole, the remainder of the black hole that is very entangled with the other radiation. And eventually, when the black hole is gone or you just have a small remnant left, almost all the entanglement is just between different parts of the radiation. But the information is all there. So that would be the viewpoint from the outside. And yet at the same time, we somehow have to implement this idea that you will fall into the black hole and, and you will not really see anything happening to you. And the way we're going to do that in this, uh, with this black hole complementarity, or at least we propose to do it, is by constructing a holographic theory that actually resides close to the event horizon of the black hole you assign some discrete set of degrees of freedom. So it's a system that has a finite number of states as given by the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. And then you have to come up with a duality or a map that actually will allow you to describe the interior. Now, you're not going to be able to describe the, you know, the interior space-time to arbitrary precision, you know, the, the semi-classical space-time, because you don't have enough degrees of freedom for that. The question is, do you have enough degrees of freedom to describe whatever any realistic experiment that would be carried out by an observer going in would predict. So another way, is there a way for infalling observers to detect that they're really living in a hologram and not in a continuum space-time? All right, so we'll get to that, hopefully. Uh, the nice thing about these is that I can, you know, I can go really fast. <laughs> All right. But before I get there, let's just very briefly mention some input from string theory into this problem, because I was sort of summarizing different. And the first one there is, is well, since, uh, well, string theory actually, at least for a subset of black holes, we can count the number of states that we have for any mass black hole. And there really is no room for, for these remnant states there. They're simply, uh, they're not needed to, to account for things there. So that's, I would say, uh, uh, strike against them. There is, of course, ADS-CFT, uh, which uh, at some level will define the non-perturbative gravity theory in terms of a manifestly unitary uh, gauge theory. So that seems to very firmly come down on the side of unitarity. Now, of course, the trick there is to understand the how do you implement this apparent locality that we see in and, and, of course, we're found extremely useful in our ordinary space-time physics. And now this is a challenge in ads -CFT, and it's a particularly a challenge when you want to actually construct the bulk inside the horizon. So that is something that Kiriakos is going to talk about. It's also something that I'm going to talk about, sort of a baby version of, towards the end of this talk, if I get there. Um, okay? And then one can actually use this... Uh, fact that, uh, or simply take this as a, as a sort of as, as, a, as a given that we have a unitary evolution here, and one can actually sort of try to do estimates by, um, so we, we did try this back in, in some papers with David Lowe, uh, on sort of how large are the non-local effects that you're going to see as the Hawking radiation is turning on. Are they actually observable? Sorry, as the information is early times, the Hawking radiation, actually there's no way to get any information out of it. That connects with what uh, we saw yesterday in, in Kiriakos' talk when uh, if, you, if you only have access to a small subsystem of a, of a complicated system, that the, the uh, state of that system is going to look maximally entangled. And it isn't until your subsystem is of order it has actually half the degrees of freedom or more that you can actually hope even to start reconstructing some of the information about the initial state. And this will be important when we reanalyze our experiment in a minute. Okay? But you can ask, how big are the effects early on, sort of 
just after the page time? Are they, are they going to be observable? And so, so we, we did some of that in this paper. And um, well, they're exponentially suppressed. At, you know, and uh, certainly very, you know, before that, uh, up until the page time, these things are going to be exponentially suppressed and clearly completely unobservable by any, any uh, infolink. Yeah? What is the reasoning that these procedures that the particular figures by Uh, there's a finite number of them. They're not, they don't have an infinite degeneracy. This, this, the, the, the density of states is finite. Again? Well, remnants, you have to have a, a distinct remnant for every possible initial black hole state. And, uh, well, you don't have that by, if just by throwing together some, some D-brains at the Planck scale. So, yes? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's uh, sure. Like I said, this was input from string theory. This is not definitive, you know, but answer. Yeah. Well, these are the ones we know how to count. Okay, now most of our attempts to go beyond these highly supersymmetric states in, in string theory, they involve um, putting together collections of brains and anti-brains, or having some motions that are, that, you know, violate BPS bounds. But the basic constituents are the same. And so getting a theory like string theory, which by the way, of course, is, is a unitary, I mean, what we really know how to do in, in, in string theory is to, is to construct unitary scattering amplitudes. Um, to getting a theory like that to somehow come up with composite objects that have finite mass but infinite degeneracy is, is I think, pretty clear that that's not, not going to happen. Why can't it be infinite degeneracy? Well, you start with some initial state that forms a black hole that has mass uh, M, and then the Bekenstein bound, Bekenstein Hawking, Bekenstein Hawking entropy tells you sort of how much entropy is, what is the maximal entropy that you get from that. And that is, uh, therefore, when the Hawking radiation is sent off, that tells you how many photons are going to be sent off. So the entanglement entropy between the um, So the remnant has to have, the remnant spectrum has to have enough states to, to, to account for that as entanglement entropy. And that can be an arbitrarily large black hole to begin with, so the remnant spectrum. So you must have a remnant that can have basically arbitrary entropy at, at, uh, at the Planck scale. And that's the argument. Okay, let's then move on to as to how, how black hole complementarity could work. And for that, we went back to um, astrophysics, and we found some work on the membrane paradigm. And there was this notion that you could actually replace black hole for the purposes of, of calculating the effects of black holes and their surroundings. Uh, you could actually, and it was efficient, they found, to replace the black hole by a, basically by the stretched horizon, which is a time-like surface, just so it's near the event horizon. They leave it pretty open how near it is. It's actually, you place the stretched horizon in, in these astrophysical situations, roughly it's commensurate with the scale of the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, basically, if you want to solve you know, a problem about a, a black hole that's interacting with an accretion disk, then you put your stretched horizon sort of somewhere uh, maybe a, a, a Schwarzschild distance away from, from, from the true horizon. And, and the point was that you could actually reproduce answers from a more complicated full GR calculation by, by sort of having this membrane and just endowing it with some microscopic, uh, so basically fluid properties. And 
So our proposal was to say that, well, like any uh, microscopic system, this really should have some microphysical basis. And so we proposed that to have sort of a minimally stretched horizon, which would have an area that's just one Planck unit larger than the, uh, than the uh, true horizon, true event horizon. And there are, you can get into also, you know, this is not easy to implement in all possible generality, you know, with all possible, you know, different types of charged black holes and rotating and so on. But um, this was sort of the notion, you just add one unit of, of so what I'm thinking here sort of is the simplest type of black hole. Um, and then that stretched horizon is going to have some dynamics uh, associated with it that has a number of states that is precisely the Bekenstein Hawking, you know, given by the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And that's basically postulate three, that this should be. And then the claim is that for all observations that you would make from far away, it there would be no way for, for, for observers far away to detect that this was, you know, to, 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 that they should be able to model any, any results of any observations that they make, okay? And yet, this was also something that was stated in the astrophysics literature, that this was something which was a useful concept to have if you were sort of interacting with systems that were a certain distance away from the black hole, but that if you were then to fall into a black hole, you wouldn't actually see this stretched horizon. It would simply be, not be uh, a feature of your description. Okay? So that's the, and then uh, we said about. It buys you that you don't, that's the, how you implement the equivalence principle. It, it's important that if you're an infalling observer, this stretched horizon actually does not have any physical reality to you. Okay. Now, for somebody who is very far away, basically you can, you can have a model. Um, and this is something that's common in physics, is that you want to have a model that can actually make predictions about observations that you can make. So if you talk about observations that can be made far away from the black hole, this is a model that will account for in particular, the unitarity of the process, because in this model, from the, for the purpose of those uh, observations, you will, nothing will actually go into the black hole. Things will actually get absorbed by this stretched horizon. They will get thermalized. The, stretch, the degrees of freedom here we'll find actually has, it, has of order, it must have be at a Planck temperature. And so um, things get thermalized and then they get re-emitted. The, the picture of this Hawking process from this point of view, from the point of view of outside observers, is simply that you see the matter is falling in. It will, of course, the redshift will slow things down. They will, and, you know, and classically you never see things go into the black hole. Here, you don't see them go in for a long time. And in fact, there will be this scrambling that's going on because of this dynamics here that will eventually uh, things will get so scrambled that by the time that the, the, this horizon is, this horizon is of course emitting radiation all the time in this view, most of it falls back onto the black hole, but the sort of low angular momentum of the S waves and maybe P waves, they will actually make it out and that's what you call Hawking radiation. So this is sort of a qualitative picture of this thing, which is, the claim is that simply you can account for any observations that you make far away from the black hole using this picture. Now, as is often the case in physics, if you go to, into a different reference frame, your mental thinking about or modeling of what's going on can be quite different. This is well known in particle physics. You, know, you do deep and elastic scattering. Things have a very, you, you interpret the results you get, the, 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 value, you know, the structure functions you get for the electron-proton scattering rather differently in the frame where the proton is at rest or in the frame where, where it's a head-on collision. But the end result is, is, is invariant, of course. You, you express things in terms of things that are invariant, but it can very much be dependent on the reference frame. And this is now we're taking this to an extreme. These are, there's an exponential redshift between the frame of the infalling observer and a frame of somebody who would be sitting there. Now, if you have an observer who's hovering at rest, just above the horizon, then this horizon will be extremely real. It will be a very hot surface. 
uh, and there would be, and of course, that temperature, there's another interpretation of that, which is an unruh temperature, because this observer has to undergo very high acceleration to avoid falling into the black hole. Okay, so we're just saying that this is a very, there's a huge difference between the, the physics, how it appears to observers who have, and of course we have no experience in ordinary physics of the kind of Lorentz boosts that are relating these two. So again, when we say that it's compatible with known low energy physics, it's simply that, you know, these observer, the boost that you need to, to go between these reference frames is way out, outside anything that, that we have experience of in, in, in laboratory experiments. Okay. So you could invoke such a membrane for every blue observer, no matter if he accelerates in small fall into a black hole or just does it here in the lecture hall? Yes. And, and you could say, okay, and for this guy, there is this membrane. Absolutely. You, could, uh, you can explain the unruh effect. This is a picture for the unruh effect, sure. No, no problem there. And the same thing would be that if you stop accelerating, or you have another observer who's not accelerating, this, this membrane is not there. Yeah, sure. Okay, so now let's go back to our uh, experiment and, uh, and re-examine it. Okay, so it's the same thing. But the point now is that, as I mentioned earlier, you do have to wait before you get the information out in the Hawking radiation. And you actually have to wait quite a long time if it's a recently formed black hole. This is this argument that Page made, uh, that it's not until you've evaporated, you, you've sent out half of the photons, so your area has shrunk by a factor of two. That's basically a, parametrically the equal, you know, that's a, a finite fraction of the lifetime of the black hole. And so, that's a very long time. Uh, so this is basically, if you, this is, this holds in general, but if you do this in three, three plus one dimension, this is m cubed. And uh, in that case, Alice has to make the, her, she has to be extraordinarily quick in making her ex experiment. She has to do her experiment and send off the message, actually in a time, because of the redshift effects in the geometry, the time she has to do it is exponentially suppressed in the black hole entropy. So this is, and then she would have to submit, you know, send this message, and, yeah. What does it have to do with redshift? I mean, as long as Alice is not crushed, um, at some point the information he generates has to come out of the dark. Right, it's a question of, Bo no, 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 but Bob will get crushed before he can get it. If she waits before she sends it, her future light cone is not, you know, is, will not intersect his world light. The point is that in order for Bob to have a chance to see it, it has to be coming out very much along the... If you go back to the Kruskal diagram that I showed you yesterday, it's an easy, this is a, actually a, a kind of a neat geometric exercise to go through. You'll find these exponential factors there. Well, but then he doesn't get any message. He has to go into the black hole to get the message. That's that's what what that's what this this experiment involved. But if it's unitary, any information will come out at some point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if he's happy just to get that information, then that's fine. He what he wanted to do. This was a, a an elaborate scheme that Charlie devised to have his graduate students test this theory, and 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 you know at a price. But uh, <laughs> but uh, all right. But actually, and this is something we, we, we scratched our heads over a little bit back in that uh, first paper, was that this seemed like a, a really unreasonable margin of, of, of uh, uh, we were you know, saved by a very comfortable margin there. And we did note that there is a, if we simply insisted that this time be, you know, that he would, we would allow it if you could have, you know, down to a Planck scale. If, if Bob was sub-Planckian and still got the message, things would be okay. And if you do that, it turns out that you get a different li uh, time scale, which is m log m. And this is something that uh, we were sort of put saying that, well, okay, this experiment will work as long as, you know, the, that the outside observer has to wait for. 
And then uh, many years later, this is precisely the number that Hayden and Preskill came up with when they just said, well, we can, they had did a version of this where Bob not only uh, participated in this experiment, but had, was actually a rather powerful being who had kept track of a black hole and knew, it's, knew a lot about it as much as possibly you could know about the initial state of a black hole. So he had captured all the Hawking radiance, so he basically knew a lot about the quantum state of the black hole, and then whatever added information that Alice comes in, and this is also a very interesting feature of quantum information theory, and to actually do the calculation, they model this dynamics, this scrambling dynamics that I just referred to, they model that as a, uh, as a quantum circuit, and where they could do very explicit calculations. And what they found was that uh, Bob actually could sort of get at this information much faster if he knew the history of the black hole. And then this time scale become, became precisely m log m, and this is, is referred to as the scrambling time. And uh, it, um, but you'll notice at that point, the experiment becomes, you know, the, the bounds become so, somewhat tight. And, and I think that's, that's interesting. Uh, indeed, they are. Um, yes, but he has, he, he is hovering here. He has his own local rest frame, so he's not at rest on this surface. Um, is that what I wanted to say? Hang on. Um, yes, that's true. He has waited. No, no, but hang on, yeah, sure, that's fine. There's, there's a family of these surfaces here, sure. I mean, when we, if we go back to the construction that I, that I gave you yesterday, there's a family of surfaces. Indeed, the picture I'm drawing here is when he has done his measurement. Uh, Alice went in earlier, so she, did, she didn't do this measurement here. She did that on a previous slice, so you're right, yes. These slices are gradually evolving in time, but you, you remember that inside the black hole, they're evolving very slowly. Uh, and here they are. Um, so Bob is sufficiently far from the horizon that he's roughly using Schwarzschild time to, to, uh, to label his. No, it's, that's, that's, that's a good labeling of his, of his. So that's what we mean that we say that he's waiting. And so these measurements are not done simultaneously. She does her measurement on an earlier slice he has to wait, he has to do these measurements on when these time slices have evolved and have intersected some more of the Hawking radiation. That's right. The the well, these are labeled by, by the asymptotic time. That, that was how the construction worked. Okay. So that is when I say that he's waiting, that, that's the time that's, that's ticking. All right. Yeah. All right. But there's another thing that, that of course, is happening here, which is you remember that when Charlie made his observation, he projected the state of the spin of, of that was going in. And this, of course, is a more general thing. Um, and if you have this picture of Hawking radiation as being sort of, there's a qualitative picture of it as being, you know, pairs that are created near, near the black hole, and then you have one of them escaping, that escaped member of the pair will then be maximally entangled with the remainer, remaining pair. And so that's sort of a simple model for how the entanglement is being sort of built up between the outgoing Hawking radiation and the, what's left behind. And if you have now the, let's just say an old black hole just to be a, a, a concrete, and if you imagine somebody now doing observations on all those Hawking photons that come out, well, when you, uh, when you measure their, their uh, polarization state, you do a projection on them. That projection will then be implemented on whatever is on the inside. By the time that the black hole is the smaller component of this, uh, well, that means that everything that's inside the black hole is being projected by those measurements. And actually, you don't even have to 
think about these measurements being carried out because as the radiation propagates out into the asymptotic region, it'll naturally decohere into, in a way that will also project things out. So that is, of course, what, that's the basic argument for the firewall, is that once you have the radiation carrying off and everything that's it, sat back here is, being max, is maximally entangled with it, well, that is going to lead to issues for, if the information is being carried out, that will lead to things being projected into some, let's say, uncomfortable state. Because, of course, by the time the observers here, Alice has dropped into the black hole, or even when she gets very close to it, she is part of this black hole state now. And uh, she's part of the matter that has dropped into the black hole. So her, and so the conclusion was, and, and, and we observed this in our paper back in 2006, that basically these outside observations of the Hawking radiation will in fact burn up the infalling observer. Now, we didn't appreciate that, that this would be, you know, uh, well, let's put it this way, we simply didn't appreciate this. So we immediately concluded that, well, this tells us that uh, you're not going to use uh, local effective field theory, and we, we went on to try to figure out some way to implement the non-locality. But uh, in a more sophisticated set of arguments, so we were just doing this based on these EPR pairs, uh, these authors here, of course, realized that, that this would be a rather general feature, and that any time that you actually extract the information from the black hole, that is going to involve a rather dramatic projection of the state of the infolding matter. And so now there's the added challenge for anybody who wants to make black hole complementarity work, which is to explain why is it that an infalling observer doesn't realize that they're being projected into a, or you know, that they're hitting a firewall. And I want to argue in the remainder of my talk, in, a, in the context of a very simple toy model, that you can have this. Uh, and that, in fact, it will take some time for this, uh, it takes, in fact, sufficient time for this projection to be implemented in a, in a, in a way that will make it more precise, uh, that by the time that you actually do find that, uh, <coughs> that the unitary evolution of the state is, is, is causing you uh, what from the, would be from uh, a bulk point of view if you're, if you're well, let me just get to the model, and then we can <laughs> see it. So this is a model that David and I have been sort of developing over a, a, over a cycle of ideas. They've sort of progressed a bit from, from these as we go along, and we're certainly not, not there yet. But I think these are some, sort of some interesting ideas that, that uh, people can, uh, that I want to put forward. So this is, these are slides from a, from a, a talk that uh, and the question now that I want to is, is the following. So how does this non-locality avoid you know, getting detected? So how can you have a local observer falling into the black hole uh, not be um, immediately um, hit by this problem, this, this firewall problem, if you like? Okay. Um, and yes. Well, I think you, you don't really need to do the information. It, it's, it's, what it boils down to is that if the information about your infalling observer is actually being emitted in the Hawking radiation, then that information can no longer be in the observer. That's basically sort of sums it up. And the question is, how do you get that to, to mesh with the observer falling through the through the horizon uh, without, without being harmed. So let me, let me try to outline that, that. 
And so the first part of it is, and I won't really talk much about it now, but is that if, you, if you're saying that there should be some effective field theory that applies outside this stretched horizon, it means that if you're thinking about an experiment where you have, so what we're going to talk about now is you, th you think about an experiment where you have a laboratory that's falling into a black hole, and you're going to do some observations in the laboratory to, to test if, if you know, ordinary quantum physics is, is, uh, is valid or not. Okay. And that laboratory is going to be described by our effective field theory, certainly, until it gets very close to the black hole. Okay? And by close here, I, I think, think we're, we're basically, I want to include in the black hole for this discussion sort of the region that is often referred to as the zone, which is sort of one Schwarzschild length uh, outside. Okay? Now, the question then is, what, how do you model the interior? So there are now two, th two competing options, if you like. One is this, we take this seriously, this, this notion that there is some set of degrees of freedom. We don't know the dynamics, but that resides on this stretched horizon. And that if it's really true that everything that goes on inside the black hole can really be encoded in those degrees of freedom, we should be able to have a physical description of what goes on inside, including when this lab falls in, that's given in terms of some uh, unitary dynamics of, of, of these degrees of freedom. And these will be, and, and in the model that I'm going to try to implement this, is these are just going to be qubits. I'm just going to put in a collection of qubits, enough qubits to account for the entropy, and I'm going to distribute them on the, on the horizon, and they're going to interact in order for this to work we'll find that they have to interact very non-locally. They basically all have to talk to each other. But to get the scrambling dynamics to work out right, it's, it's well known that their interaction should, should be what's called k-local. That is, they only talk to a finite number of their friends at a time. So the interaction terms involve a finite number of qubits. Uh, in the model that we're going to look at, it's just they're going to be two local, but you can imagine four locals and so on. Okay. Now. There should also, in order to implement complementarity, there should be a local effective field theory, or at least an approximately local effective field theory, that is valid when you go through the horizon at least, and maybe a little bit further in, because that's, there are no strong curvature effects. You don't really, you know, the equivalence principles suggest that you should uh, be able to do that. And now the challenge is, how do you actually reconcile these two? Or how do you find... Uh, and so we propose that there is a, and in particular, there will be this region that's close to the black hole where both of these theories are going to be valid. And you had better be sure, make sure that you don't give rise to contradictions between their predictions in that region. Okay. But let me make some, uh, let me stack back and make clear that this effective field theory that I'm going to construct, or sort of, or at least outline how you construct. It's not an effective field theory that describes you know, the black hole and its history. It's just tailored to describe the observations that are, could be made by this observer and maybe some observers who preceded him by a little bit or will come after them by a little bit. Okay? So that is, that's a very important point. But this is, it has a limited, the, the, the scope of this theory is quite limited. It's just uh, we just want, it's a, a point of principle that we want to argue that these two descriptions can be, be uh, consistent. And it's also important that we don't need to be able to uh, predict with our theory to absolute precision the outcomes of measurements because any measurements that are carried out by an infalling observer are going to have limited precision. That observer as you all know, has a limited proper time to live. So they cannot carry out arbitrarily pre precise measurements from that perspective. And there's another restriction, which is that the size of their measuring apparatus is limited. They cannot have arbitrarily large uh, measuring apparatus. That, and that also, because if they did, this would be an experiment where a black hole falls into the lab and not vice versa. Okay. So these are very important restrictions. It means that I don't have to get everything exactly right. I just have to get it right within the precision that's attainable 
in, in these observations. Okay. Now I'm going to skip a lot of things here, but <coughs> there are two conditions that it turns out you have to have for this to be to be, get, make this work, and that is this statement that Hayden and Preskill uh, gave us that, in fact, if you're going to have, and the, the, the problem that I have here is that if I'm falling into the black hole and I'm going to have a description that holds, roughly the, the, the description has to hold for a time of order the scrambling time before I fall in and then until I hit the singularity, which turns out will be in these time slices that I'm using is also of order this, the scrambling time, okay? And so during that time, if I can have Hawking radiation, well, there will be emitted Hawking radiation during that time. And the question is, when will, if somebody outside is making observations of that, when will that start to lead to problems? When will that, the, the projections that those observations implement, when will they start to make my tests of, let's say, EPR paradox or something inside my lab start to, to go wrong? Because that is what will happen, of course, is that the, the uh, now I forget which one was theory one and which one was theory two. The stretched horizon theory, of course, because it is non-local, it will eventually, uh, you know, eventually our infolding observer will detect that things he's not in Kansas anymore. And that, uh, but the question is exactly when that will happen. Yeah. You see there, um, I guess on the other slide, that <coughs> It doesn't, uh, I guess there's a firewall for an observer who has measured the state of the black hole? Yes. Um, uh, that, yeah, sure, that, that's right, that was really, yeah. The, all of this, all of these arguments that go in, and you know, I, I won't have time to go through here, they are for, you know, typical observers who make fairly simple observations. Do you have in mind an observer, so what does measuring mean? It means that somehow the radiation got got to interact with something else and there was decoherence. Yes. But that, what, what if the radiation just runs into a bunch of dust or galaxies and gets measured by that? I mean, it's the same process ultimately, just yeah. decohere that, um, wouldn't that then also lead to? Um, it will. Kind of, the question is, how long does it take? Uh -huh. And that is precisely what we do there. We, we have a proposal. Let me get to that. Okay. And so, basically, we have these the way we do this, and let me see if I can, right. So basically the bottom line is on this slide. But what we'll find is that we have this, what we will call the exact evolution, which is this Hamiltonian that describes my qubits on the, on the stretched horizon. That's going to evolve, and that, that is going to encode the, uh, so physics of whatever that's going on inside the black hole, including the lab, once it's in there, okay? And that physics is going to be, well, it's these non-local interactions between the qubits, and of course, eventually that's going to make, you know, things evolve in such a way that it's going to look very non-local from the viewpoint of somebody who is, uh, thinks he is just in some local space-time falling in, okay? And we'll, I'll, I'll be, give you a quantitative, or, or a, in principle, how you would test this quantitatively. And the way we do this is, here's my toy model. Let me, so I've already described roughly, there's some, some things that go into it. There has to be, you know, you need to, you need to uh, scale the interactions in it in such a way that you have, have, that your energy is extensive and so on. And it's, you've got these couplings. Uh, they are random. We, we don't, uh, in fact, for the toy model that we're looking at, we assume that we have some random uh, set of couplings that are too local. And then what we will do is we will construct from that a mean field evolution. And this is something that is, is you know, is, is, is a, a machinery that has been developed, these sort of time-dependent time mean field constructions. And it's a state, and, and to get back to a point that Kyriakos was making, this is a state-dependent uh, construction because what I do is I start with the initial state of the system, the spin system, uh, when the lab is just entered the zone, and I construct this mean field Hamiltonian, that is, 
And, I, and then I, I, I construct a mean field Hamiltonian that works uh, on each side of this, uh, the spin system. And once I've done that, th that's going to define for me a local evolution. So the conjecture is that this mean field Hamiltonian is in fact a dual description of whatever would be the bulk evolution for the involving observer. Okay? So I have some initial state. Then I have two ways of evolving it forward. I have the exact non-local, let's call it holographic evolution. And then I have this mean field Hamiltonian that I, at that initial stage, I constructed. And I evolve forward with that mean field Hamiltonian. And then as a lab, we took something very simple. Our lab was just an EPR pair. And we asked, in that EPR pair, under the mean field evolution, well, it'll just stay entangled. Whereas under the exact evolution, this, each qubit in that pair is actually interacting non-locally with all the other qubits in the black hole. And eventually, the entanglement between them is going to get transferred uh, out of the pair. And that would look like a violation of, of local physics from the point of view of the falling <laughs> observer. So the question is, what's the time scale on which this entanglement that you sort of break the EPR correlation between the pair in your lab. Okay? And because this is, these are spin systems, uh, one has tools to deal with it. One can use the so-called trace distance to ask. So we have some initial state. I'm going to evolve it in two, two ways. And eventually, these evolutions are going to diverge. And the question is, how, on what time scale do they diverge? And what we found, uh, doing some numerics and also making use of some uh, very nice theoretical arguments by, or, or uh, you know, applications of the Lee Robinson bound by these authors, is that this will take a time of order log n, which is the scrambling time of the system. And then, interestingly, and I don't a priori this, well, maybe it had to be so, but it definitely was true. So this was, this were some numerics. This, this is not great numerics. I warn you, large n for us was 14. That's actually more or less what, you know, really good people doing numerics can maybe get that up a, few, a little bit higher. But we, we saw actually very much this, this sort of exponential growth in, the, in, the, um, in, in this trace distance. Yes? As it falls, actually, no, it's passed through the horizon. This is, uh, this is really its uh, decoherence as it is sort of being absorbed into the stretched horizon. That's, that's the end. Uh, um, I just, can you, independently of the toy model that you use to support it, can you just clarify the statement that you're making about black holes? For example, if I have a black hole that has more than half evaporated and its, it's Hawking radiation has interacted with large numbers yeah. of degrees of freedom elsewhere, is the claim that somebody can fall in smoothly at that point or not? Yes, because we did this also then in the spin model. The way you do that is you purify the state of the black hole by, you know, uh, take the spin system, you, you construct a state where you've uh, sort of maximally entangled the spins, and then you declare that only half of them are part of the black hole. That's sort of operationally how you can do it. That way you have an overall pure state in the system, and, but, and then you can ask about what happens to this lab. The lab is, of course, initially fine. It's coming from outside. And then you ask about the further evolution, and you get, you get very similar. So there's a specific thought experiment, right, where uh, the involving observer, Alice, takes along with her purification of the particular outgoing Hawking quantum that she's going to pass by. Right, and then she's going to be an observer who might uh, would have to I think I'm, I'm prepared to make statements about observers who, are, who, who don't have any knowledge about the black hole. She doesn't. So this is not a measurement. She just, this is kind of the opposite direction of, in terms of the question. She just oh, okay, unitary sorry. on the Hawking radiation, which is completely coherent, and it just takes uh, right. a bit with her. And it's just that she has to have some theory for what, what's going on in her lab, and there right. are three bits which, which violate <coughs> subjectivity once she's crossed right. the horizon. They're all in her lab, so it's no longer a thing where we can say, well, Bob has one theory and Alice has another. Right. I, I think that is going to work here because uh, this construction that we made, I think, was pretty much along those lines.
we, we should talk about that afterwards. But I think the, as long as, well, okay, the thing that we did look at was we basically looked at an initial state, which was this black hole state, which was maximally entangled. And that would include, then, I think, this thing that she's carrying with her. And then, and then, the toy model, how it right. exactly corresponds to the black hole, but it should not be difficult to state what happens in the context of the black hole. Right. There's nothing sophisticated about these systems. It's all low energy stuff. And yeah, yeah. No, no, um, and I agree. But I think <laughs> what, what will happen, the, the thing that we did look at was, again, we had the system, the lab system we looked at was this entangled pair, okay? And we did that in two types of environments. So two, we, you know, we, we, we tensored it with either uh, a, a, you know, a, a black hole state that was corresponded to a young black hole, which was just some random pure state. Um, and then we took the other one was where we had it in a density matrix that was maximally entangled with some purifier that, that just remains outside. And in both cases, we calculated the uh, time evolution of the, uh, you know, the, the, basically the decoherence de of this, this pair. Well, and what is this pair? You see, I don't understand which of the things you're talking about correspond to which degrees of freedom in the physical space. Time. And so well, I'm, I'm having a hard time discussing the toy model. But right. whatever the toy model tells you about how to resolve this issue, it should be possible to just state that in terms of the ingoing and outgoing Hawking quantum and its purification from the early Hawking radiation. Because that's a very sharp. Um, um, thought experiment, which, which I think, you know, Rick Well, uh, I think that may, I think we need to come back to that. Um, I'm, yeah, I don't want to. It, it will, it will uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is a model where you can ask such questions, for sure. And I think, um, Well, and yeah, we should do that. <laughs> anyway, so the, this, the main answer, uh, result is that this doesn't happen immediately. It takes uh, time of order, the scrambling time for the decoherence to occur. And then um, the other piece of information that we have that I didn't tell you about, which is that... Um, If you actually ask about, in this, on these time slices, how long does an observer actually have left to live when they fall into a black hole? Well, the upper bound on that is the same scrambling time. So that's suggestive. It doesn't prove anything. But it's suggestive that you have these two dual descriptions of the same effect. One is this decoherence of the infalling matter because of these non-local interactions. And the other one is sort of the bulk classical version of it, which is the strong curvature effects that you're running into at the, at the black hole center. So let me, let me leave you with that. Um, and uh, you see, I anticipated this because I put the summary slide there, you know, before the rest of the talk, you know, where I also had the summary slide. So I'm beginning to know myself a little bit. In this. So anyway, thank you. Well, I mean, our conjecture is that the nice slice description is this mean field description, right? because that is a local that is a local Hamiltonian evolution that you, and it's built from the initial state of the system in a, in a very you know in a, in a constructive way that that is given, right? Yes, so that's exactly what we're calculating. We're calculating the trace distance between the state, the initial state evolved by the mean field, this time-dependent mean field, and the state that you get from the same initial state when you evolve it using the non-local uh, scrambling dynamics of the... Uh, that's, that's precisely the issue, right? And we're finding that this, is, this, this decoherence time is of order the scrambling time. Um, 
you see, we're not really, the model doesn't contain the outside. So we're, I'm not sure that we can. Um, this is just a model of the, of, of, of the interior. And the outside only enters in that we, when, if you have you know, a maximally entangled black hole state, we, we sort of purify it in a specific way. But we didn't have any, we haven't built into it any, any, any sort of coupling to the outside. That's, that's clearly something that you would want to do. And, and maybe there are some, some of these issues will resurface then, like, like uh, Raphael is suggesting. But at least this is a very relatively simple uh, setting in which to, to study these questions. Uh, yeah, I think I've, um, uh, well, yeah, sure, why not, yeah, yeah, they're, uh, for what they're worth, sure. <laughs> um. Any more questions? So let me just mention uh, that Lars is leaving tomorrow morning, so if you want to talk to him about his lectures, then you should do it today, okay? So I think we should have half an hour of break now, let's meet again at 10 past 11. And now let's thank Lars for, for his head of lectures.